Hi, this is Keith Kaiser with another word of wisdom from the Gospel according to Mark. Today we're continuing in Mark 15, and we're reading the very solemn account of the trial of our Lord Jesus before Pilate. We're beginning today at verse 6, Mark 15 and verse 6. Now at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd so that they should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. And this shows us that what happened to the Lord Jesus wasn't some accident of history. I mean, there have been miscarriages of justice through the centuries that were inadvertent. Sometimes innocent people have been wrongly imprisoned, or sometimes maybe even wrongly executed. And it takes a while before people catch up with the wrong that's been done. Mistakes are made. Human beings err. And yet, when we read about the trials of the Lord Jesus, that's not what's going on here. The Lord Jesus is clearly innocent. The Lord Jesus, even more so, is perfectly righteous. And that comes out over and over again through the different gospel accounts of our Lord's trial. That as people examine these accounts and read them fairly, they say, well, this has nothing to do with jurisprudence, nothing to do with legality. That really, you can see it's a fait accompli that Jesus is going to be cruelly executed. That his enemies have arrayed themselves and they're committed to this course of destroying Jesus, of killing him and doing away with him as they think. And every one of the authorities that presides over these things is basically brought to see the fact that there's really nothing he has done that's worthy of death. Now, the exception might be Caiaphas in the Sanhedrin, who deems Jesus uh, guilty of blasphemy and therefore, under the law of Moses, worthy of being executed. But, in fact, we said it's only blasphemy if it's not true, if Jesus isn't the Son of God, if he wasn't the one whom the Father sent, if he wasn't Messiah, then of course it was blasphemy. But all the evidence points to the fact that the Lord Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that just exactly who he claimed to be, so he is. And the final vindication of that doesn't only lie in the works that he did, how he went about doing good and healing all the people and testifying to God and giving his word, but we can finally see the proof in the resurrection of Christ, that he was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, as Romans 1, 4 says. So we see the Father raising up the Son and vindicating him. This same Jesus, whom you crucified, God has raised up and made both Lord and Christ, Peter said in Acts 2. It's God reversing man's verdict. You say guilty, I say no, approved of God. You say a blasphemer, I say no, the Christ. You say a criminal who's worthy of death, I say no, he's Lord, Lord of all. He's going to rule over everything until all enemies put under his feet. And the Lord Jesus one day is actually going to be the judge, as John 5 and Acts 17 would tell us. Now, they had this tradition where the Romans could be uh, appearing merciful, and they could release a prisoner to them. And so the question comes that, obviously, when you compare the different gospel accounts of the trial before Pilate, Pilate early on sees that the charges against Jesus are specious. In other words, there's nothing to them. There's really no case here. He's done nothing worthy of death. Famously, he's going to wash his hands to try to publicly demonstrate that he doesn't see the guilt of the one whom he calls this just person. Uh, but he tries every expedient to set Jesus free without actually taking a hard stand himself. In other words, 
He's the political operator. He's kind of moving and making many machinations here to try and get Jesus out of his courtroom, to try and put him over on Herod, or try and release him on a technicality, or try even to torture him, but not take his life, all in a vain attempt to satisfy the bloodlust of the enemies of Christ. And even here we read how he asks them in verse 10, or uh, if they are uh, in verse 9, he asks if they want him to release the king of the Jews. But in verse 10, it says he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. So he knew this wasn't really about sedition. This wasn't that Jesus was some kind of deep cover terrorist, that he was in a sleeper cell and he was going to be a real danger to Caesar or to Rome. Pilate could kind of see through that. And he even uses this title, the king of the Jews, somewhat mockingly to twist the knife into the enemies of Christ, knowing they don't acknowledge him as the king of the Jews. And so he's trying to get them to go for some other expedient. Now, the amazing thing is the contrast between Barabbas and our Lord Jesus Christ, that we have Jesus, who, as I say, is an innocent man in the eyes of the Roman law and in the Hebrew law as well, and a perfectly righteous man, as we know. Not only can you not accuse him of bad, but he's always done the good. And the Lord Jesus is that perfectly righteous one who always did the will of the Father. He's the son of the Father who works alongside the Father. He said, John 5, 17, my Father works hitherto, and I work. Now, Barabbas, interestingly, his name in Aramaic means son of the Father as well. So many people have pointed out that this is basically a contrast of two sons of the Father. But the question is, whose Father, or who is the Father that we're speaking of? And when we think of the Lord Jesus, the works that he did, going about healing people who were lame, opening the eyes of the blind, opening the ears of the deaf, opening the mouths of the mute, cleansing the lepers, even raising the dead, these were all acts of mercy and compassion, the love of God practically displayed. And yet a life of perfect holiness, always devoted to the Father, always doing the Father's will, the Lord Jesus Christ is truly the Son of the Father, even as the Lord, as the Father declared of him at the baptism in Matthew 3, for example, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so he was the one who always brought the Father glory. But Barabbas, whose son was he? Well, we read about Barabbas in verse 7. It says he was chained with his fellow rebels. So here was a man who was rebellious. He was a rebel. Now, of course, a rebel against the authority of Rome. And one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, as the saying goes. So there are people right down to the present day who, in the name of a cause or in the name of a religion or in the name of some principle, they will fight against a government that is over them and they will try to gain independence. So uh, some might say, well, this man's actually a patriot. And yet, like many people that have participated in insurrections, uh, they finance their insurrection by crime. And so this man had not only rebelled, we read he had committed murder. And we read about the other two that were crucified with the Lord Jesus, that they were robbers. So these were people who committed armed robbery. And likely they're the other members or two of the other members of Barnabas's gang or his cell. So this is not some sort of political idealist, some sort of a noble figure that's been unjustly imprisoned. This is a man who's a rebel and a murderer. Now, who would his father be then? Well, the Lord Jesus said about Satan that he's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And 1 John 3 would also bear that truth out. And where you see somebody killing and somebody uh, just doing these acts of violence wantonly and rebelling against authority, even a bad authority, you know, is ordained by God. Ultimately, they're going to have to answer to the living God. God raises up governments and God puts down governments, and the dead, small, and great will have to stand before the great white throne of judgment. The Lord is going to judge, in other words, the kings and presidents and prime ministers and potentates of this world all throughout its history. And like everyone else, they're going to have to give an account for how they've lived. And only those 
who've repented and put their faith in the Lord Jesus will be saved. That's the only way that one can escape judgment. But this man Barabbas gave every indication of being a son of his father, the devil, a man who had lived an evil, violent, wicked life in many respects. But it's amazing how the multitude's crying out for him to release one, and Pilate thinks, ah, oh, this is what we're looking for. This is the expedient I've been seeking. Verse 9, Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? But, verse 11, the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that they should rather release Barabbas to them. Now, this is kind of a non sequitur, isn't it? It doesn't really fit. It doesn't make sense. The chief priests are the people that have their authority over the temple because of Roman permission. The Romans had to sign off on the autonomy that they enjoyed at the Temple Mount. And as Caiaphas said in John chapter 11, it is more expedient that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. So they wanted to get rid of Jesus in the name of preserving the status quo. In other words, let's not cause an uproar, let's not engender a riot, and uh, therefore we'll get rid of Jesus because people are getting carried away following him, the whole world seems to be going after him, and if this keeps up, the Romans will come and take our place and nation. And yet it's those very chief priests here who are arguing for a man who had been involved in a rebellion and a man who had fought against the Roman authority. And it's ironic that, again, Pontius Pilate is the procurator, the Roman official who's judging this case. He's supposed to maintain the rights and the laws of Rome. In fact, later they're going to say to him, if you set this man free, you are not a friend of Caesar. And ultimately that seems to decide the case, that he chooses Caesar, he chooses his career over any kind of loyalty to the truth in exonerating a clearly righteous and innocent man. Now, it's ironic then that Barabbas, this wicked rebel, this murderer, is going to be set free when the Lord Jesus Christ, who not only never rebelled nor never committed murder, he was always obedient to the Father. In fact, he said, I was not rebellious, but I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked out the beard. He is the one who, as Philippians 2 says, was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And this perfectly obedient one would be delivered to be killed in such a foul, perfidious way. What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? There, verse 13 so they cried out again, crucify him. What a terrible thing that is. Crying out for the Lord Jesus' blood. Crying out for him to be killed. But crying out not just for him to be killed, but to be executed in the most painful, shameful way possible. He, they wanted him absolutely humiliated. And Pilate responds in verse 14, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, crucify him. It's a lot like today. It's not necessarily reason and who makes the best argument that wins. It's who can shout the loudest and shout down your opponent. And here, truth was not going to be upheld. Uh, truth, as the poet said, forever on the scaffold, never on the throne. Well, that's what we see in this case more than ever in history, that it didn't matter about the truth. It didn't matter about justice. They just shouted, louder. And so Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Now that last phrase kind of rolls off the tongue very easily, but when we think of what we know of scourging historically in the Roman Empire, it was a very vicious torture, a whipping of the Lord Jesus, as the prophets had said, till his back would look like a plowed field. Men with practiced viciousness peeling off a large chunks of our Lord's skin and inflicting the maximum amount of pain and then delivering him to be crucified, which we, of course, know would entail being nailed to the cross for our Lord Jesus and suffering what he did there. And yet I think about Barabbas being released and the Lord Jesus being crucified. I think I see in that incident a little bit of my own story because, you know, I was no better than Barabbas. I was just as guilty under the law of God, that I too was a lawbreaker. I too was a rebel. I too was a transgressor. I'm one of those sinners for whom Christ died. 
and the sinner in this case wasn't punished. The man who was clearly guilty was set free. The man who was clearly righteous and perfect and innocent, he was the one who was put as a substitute for the guilty man on the cross. And that is the gospel in some, isn't it? That's just to put it in one sentence, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. That everyone who is saved will be saved because they say, he died for me. That he went and took my place. In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior, the hymn writer says. I hope you know that today, friend. I hope you've come to God and thanked him and asked him to save you, saying, I know you gave your son. I know he went to that cross voluntarily. I know in spite of the machinations of men and all the injustices that were committed at the trials, Jesus could have gone free. Jesus could have come down from the cross. But the Son of God went to that cross and willingly laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin. And then three days later, exactly as he prophesied, and as the Old Testament prophesied, he rose again from the dead, proving who he was, and proving that his offer of salvation is genuine. And you can have it today, friend, by coming and saying, yes, I, I'm a son of the devil. I'm a sinner who deserves judgment. I'm a rebel and a murderer uh, in that I've hated my fellow man. And I didn't care about Jesus dying for me for many a year. And I probably would have been among the crowd. As the hymn writer says, ashamed I hear my mocking voice cry out among the scoffers. That probably would have been me. I've done things certainly just as bad in my life. And I can only be saved by the grace of God. I put my faith in the Lord Jesus. I want Jesus Christ the Lord to be my Lord. And I trust in what he did to save me and nothing else. I hope you'll do that if you never have. And if you're a believer already, friend, go and tell somebody about the Lord Jesus today. Thank you for listening.